The road to SteamOS for everyone just got a lot clearer. Arch Linux, which is what's cooking behind the scenes when you run SteamOS, just announced that they are working directly with Valve from now on. This was posted by SteamDB over on Twitter, and it's a letter from Levente Polyak, hopefully I got the pronunciation right there, who is the leader of Arch Linux project. This is what they said. We are excited to announce that Arch Linux is entering into a direct collaboration with Valve. Valve is generously providing backing for two critical projects that will have a huge impact on our distribution, a build service infrastructure and a secure signing enclave. So basically, it seems like Valve is at least temporarily funding the development of Arch Linux, which makes tons of sense since Valve built SteamOS on top of Arch Linux. If Valve is sending money their way, then you can be sure that it's to make changes that will benefit Valve, SteamOS, and by extension, all of us. In Polyak's letter, they said that they are working to build service infrastructure and a secure signing enclave. But what exactly does that mean? Well, as somebody that doesn't do this kind of thing for a living, I'm going to have to put my trust in the internet, which is dangerous, I know, so if I get something wrong, please let me know in the comments down below that like button and we can all learn from my screw up together. But I found this on a post over at the BBS for ArchLinux.org. The member Prague Andy posted, Valve wants a more robust chain of trust for the packages it uses and maybe quicker or more reliable updates. The combination of a build service with the secure signing enclave will mean that the package maintainers can submit a changed package build to the build server and it automatically builds and signs the package ready for inclusion into the repository. No need for the maintainers to build their own, build it on their own machines or develop automation tools for builds. A simple build server does already exist that provides the resources that they're using, as in bring your own automation tools and signing has to be done manually by the maintainer. Essentially, this should speed up development of Arch Linux because the people working on it will have a lot less manual stuff to do when making changes down the road. More work that Arch Linux does, the easier it is for Valve to ship SteamOS, and so that sounds like a win for me and you and everybody else who prefers to play games on SteamOS. Moving on, pretty much everyone got this email about Valve changing their subscriber agreement, which 99% of the time is bad news. But if you're playing on Steam, you also got a notification there, and it was very intrusive. Mine showed up while I was playing on my ROG Ally X, which has Bazite installed, and it was hooked up to my arcade cabinet at the time. It ended up getting me killed in Zelda Dungeons to Infinity, or Dungeons of Infinity. I can never remember the name of it. But I was only on the first level, so it didn't really matter. It's not that really, not that big a deal. My friend Bob got it while he was streaming the new Zelda game on Twitch. He was emulating it on his Steam Deck, and it kicked him out of the game, essentially, because he couldn't do anything until he actually accepted the agreement. I was in the middle of a game, man! It's kind of ridiculous that Valve would send this out and force it to completely cover the screen of whatever game you're playing. It really should have been something that happens the next time that you boot Steam, instead of interrupting people's gameplay. But this wasn't bad news, at least... It wasn't bad news if you weren't playing a game at the time because this is actually now v much less restrictive. Prior to this, if you wanted to sue Valve, you couldn't because there was a forced arbitration clause in their end user license agreement. If you agree to that original one, which you have to in order to play games on Steam, it basically meant that you did not have the ability to sue Valve because you could never take them to court. Basically, if you and Valve didn't agree about something, rather than go to court, someone outside of the legal system that is considered, I'm using quotes here, impartial, an impartial third party would make a decision about who's right and who's wrong. But they don't have to take the law into consideration when they do that. As The Verge points out, this method is usually faster, but the consumer generally tends to get screwed most of the time. And sure enough, before this change, Valve's agreement said, you and Valve ag agree to resolve all disputes and claims between us in individual binding arbitration. For all disputes related to Steam, your account, hardware, or the company's content and services. The new agreement has that stuff removed. And I've seen some people say that this is because the old agreement was deemed unenforceable, but 
I'm not a lawyer, so who friggin' knows? Either way, this is good news for consumers as they can now take Valve to court if they need to. Though I wouldn't rush out and sue Valve for little things because they have lots of money and they have lots of lawyers and suing them would be prohibitively expensive. But hey, if you have the means and a good reason, good luck. Next up in video game law, a topic that I didn't, I never thought that I would spend this much of my adult life talking about, but the idea of owning your games, you don't. You, I see a lot of back and forth about it. You can keep pretending that you do, but when we're talking about digital games, you do not own your games unless you bought them at certain stores, and most people aren't shopping at those stores. California just passed a law that will require store, stores, which honestly, should we even call them stores anymore? But it'll require storefronts to tell you that you don't own anything when they sell you a game. I guess I can't call it selling a game. I guess I could say licensing a game to you. I found this over at gamesindustry.biz. A new California law will compel digital storefronts to tell consumers they don't own their purchases. It will prohibit using terms like buy and purchase when offering the sale of digital goods unless they're clarifying that customers don't own the item and are simply licensing it. This would include providing a plain language statement before a transaction with a link to access the terms and conditions of that license or making consumers aware that a digital game can be removed from your library if the seller no longer holds the rights to the product. A perfect example of this happened about a year ago. Ubisoft was had delisted The Crew, which is a racing game. They did this because the idea of spending money on the servers and re-upping the licenses for the game were deemed too expensive. Ubisoft offered refunds to anyone that had recently bought the game, but if you bought it a while ago, you were screwed essentially. Something that you paid for just vanished from your library and there was pretty much nothing you could do about it. I understand that legally when they no longer have the rights to a song that's in a game or you know, license to use the cars that are in the game, when that license runs out, they have to pull the game or they have to pay money to renew that license. Ubisoft decided it was easier to deal with the bad PR than it was to pay money to keep the older game running. Of course, Ubisoft is no stranger to bad PR. That's just par for the course for them these days. Now, if it's a game that you play offline, that isn't a huge deal because you could just keep playing it and nobody else could buy it after that. But for a game that's played online, when the servers vanish, so does your game. And that's bullshit. I think it's good that someone is making companies be honest, but what I'd like to see more is if they would force these companies to honor their deals with consumers. Companies like Ubisoft shouldn't be allowed to just yank games from your library because they didn't future-proof the, their back-end business deals. The least that they should do is offer refunds to anyone that asks for it. They only offered refunds to people that recently bought the game, but who decides what recent means? What if you bought this game when it first came out and you played it every single day? Maybe it was your favorite game and you woke up and you played that game for an hour every day. Sure, you had your fun with the game, but if I buy Star Wars Monopoly and Milton Bradley decides that they aren't going to renew the license for Star Wars, they don't get to come to my house and take the board game away. Digital games shouldn't be any different. So the new law, yeah, it's a step in the right direction, but it doesn't go nearly far enough to protect gamers from the long reach of these giant corporations. And well, that that pisses me off. And speaking of things that piss me off, Nintendo just hit my friend Russ, who runs the channel Retro Game Core, with another copyright strike. Full disclosure, Russ is a regular on the Nerd Nest podcast, and he's probably one of the nicest guys in the world, so you should absolutely go subscribe to him. But before you do, say it with me. Emulation is not piracy. Why is Nintendo so mad at Russ? Well, a few videos ago, he posted a video about the MIG Switch Dumper, which is a device that allows you to make legal backups of the Nintendo Switch cartridges that you own. This makes an exact copy of the game right down to the identifying codes for that game. That means it can't really be used for piracy. It's used for backup because if I buy a MIG switch dumper and I dump one of my games and then I share that with somebody and we both go online at the same time, well, Nintendo can detect that and ban our accounts. 
So people aren't using this for piracy, they're using it to back up your stuff. So why would you do this? Well, number one, game preservation, which we established earlier, is f***ing important. Number two, you do this so that you can play games that you paid for legally on hardware that can run those games at frame rates higher than the low teens. Zelda Echoes of Wisdom, I'm looking at you. But the thing is, it doesn't matter why you do it. You bought the physical game. It should be yours to do with as you please. Nintendo can't go after Rust for showing people how to make legal backups of their game. But what they can do is throw copyright strikes at anyone that is showing something that they don't like because it happens to have footage of their game or maybe even just a picture of their game. His second strike happened last week and it was because he was showing a Wii U emulator on Android. Now, now I'm not a lawyer, so perhaps I'm wrong about this and don't count take this as legal advice, but what Russ was doing here should have fallen under fair use as his work was transformative, educational, and about a video game system that is no longer for sale the eShop on the Wii U has been shut down, so Nintendo shouldn't be able to take a swing at him quite so easily. But because of the way YouTube works, Russ has to walk on eggshells for a while. So now he has two strikes. And for those of you that don't know how YouTube works, a third strike means your channel gets deleted. A channel Russ put years of work into, where he built up an audience of close to 600,000 people since beginning, since starting the channel during the pandemic. I've seen a bunch of people saying that Russ shouldn't have posted these videos, which I will say that is victim blaming. Nintendo doesn't have the legal ground to go after him for showing people how to back up their own games legally. Instead, they decide to bully him with a shitty loophole in YouTube's policies. Russ didn't do anything wrong. And if he went to court, I think that he would probably win against Nintendo, but the legal battles are slow and expensive, and international legal battles are slower and expensiver? Yeah, it's not a word, but whatever. So, of course, Russ isn't gonna go to the mattresses against Nintendo. They have way too many highly paid lawyers that only exist to deal with this kind of bullshit. And Nintendo knows that this is why they're able to bully everyone into submission over and over and over again. If you wanna know more about Nintendo being a bully, there's a link in the video down below that like button. Next, I wanna talk about Capcom's recommended specs for the next game in the Monster Hunter series, Monster Hunter Wilds. For minimum specs, which Capcom targets at 1080p, they want you to have an Intel Core i5-10600, an Intel Core i3-12100F, or if you're AMD, an AMD Ryzen 5 3600 for a CPU. You'll need 16 gigs of RAM and a graphics card uh, of like a GeForce GTX 1660 Super or an AMD Radeon RX 5600 XT with six gigs of VRAM and a whopping 140 gigs of storage on your SSD. Capcom says an SSD is required and the game will run at 1080p upscaled from 720p at 30 frames per second on the lowest graphic settings. That's again, the minimum specs. Their recommended specs are again, targeting 1080p. For a CPU, you'll wanna upgrade to an Intel Core i5-11600K or a Core i5-12400. And on the AMD side of things, a Ryzen 5 3600X or a Ryzen 5 5500. Again, you'll need 16 gigs of RAM and for your GPU, you'll need an NVIDIA a, a, a 2070 Super or a 4060. And if you're rocking an AMD GPU, they say you should be running the minimum of a 6700 XT with eight gigs of VRAM. This targets 60 frames per second, but a caveat, frame generation has to be enabled under the medium graphic settings. The thing about frame generation is that it can introduce a bunch of latency. I don't know if Capcom's implementation will introduce latency or not, so we'll have to wait and find out. The game will run between 30 and 60 frames per second on the PS5 and other consoles, and the live stream that they showed actually actually showed it was fluctuating all over the place. I am very interested to see how this performs on the PS5 Pro, which has PSSR, which is PlayStation's upscaling uh, solution. The devs posted this about it. To be honest, we are still in the process of verifying compatibility with the PS5 Pro, so we can't say anything definite. We will announce it when we have something to tell you. It seems a little bit 
high, I guess, especially since the last Monster Hunter game was on the Nintendo Switch, and it did some damn numbers. The game is gorgeous, and for the few people that'll be able to run it on, you know, full settings, that's not me. Um, it can be pretty expensive to get a graphics card that can run this thing, but I wish the game was a little bit more accessible for people with lower spec machines like the Steam Deck or ROG Ally or Ally X or Legion Go or anything like that. But if you go back and look at Monster Hunter World, it did launch with some pretty high requirements at the time and people complained a bunch, but it sold really well. And eventually we got patches that gave unlimited frame rates and other bonuses. So perhaps Capcom is just following that same playbook. 